So um, moving on to more um, advanced prostate cancer, um, you know, we have this group of patients uh, that we categorize as uh, having non-metastatic cash resistant prostate cancer. Um, and uh, could you talk a little bit about how um, PSMA PET imaging can potentially change that diagnosis and uh, what, what that holds sure. for those patients? We're going to have a stage migration of those patients to metastatic disease if they're high risk enough. Uh, so, you know, if you look at where those patients who are at risk dwell in terms of those risk strata, that's basically rapid doubling times of nine or 10 months or faster. And previous studies have shown that the majority of those patients have imageable disease. If you take those criteria, for example, from the Spartan trial, uh, it's been demonstrated that those patients that meet that criteria, basically all of them have imageable disease and about half of those patients have imageable metastatic disease. So you're gonna have a stage migration from those patients to just calling them some terminology which allows them to be designated as having visualized disease on a scan. From a treatment paradigm standpoint, you know, non-metastatic CRPC has drug approval that is quite overlapping for metastatic CRPC. Enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide, they're all approved for both. So that, you know, just diagnosing that disease earlier won't necessarily open up some window of treatment opportunity that those patients were otherwise not, you know, not, not able to access. But you will be recategorizing those patients and you just need to be careful when you do recategorize those patients that you're not implying that they're living longer with metastatic disease, you just diagnosed it earlier. Right, okay, very interesting. Um, so moving on from diagnosis to more therapeutic um, options or uh, utility of uh, PSMA, um, can you talk about the mechanics of how um, PSMA is being utilized for therapeutic um, interventions? Absolutely. So the field of theranostics is, is that which marries diagnostics and therapy. And uh, in, in fact, the word theranostics is the marriage of therapeutics and diagnostics. The, the scientific basis of that is if you can image a molecule, then you can swap the radioactive payload from a PET tracer to a therapeutic uh, dose of radiation. And that can be either a beta emitter or an alpha emitter. Typical beta emitters are putitium. Typical alpha emitters are represented by actinium. Uh, and so if you can image the patient's disease, you can, you, can, you can treat that patient's disease by virtue of moving from a diagnostic radioactive payload to a therapeutic one. Lutetium is the more commonly used. It's a beta emitter, um, but actinium also looks like it's a very promising in terms of developing in the future, and that's a, a, an alpha emitter. The difference between the two being that beta emitters are generally lower energy, but have a longer uh, pathway. Alphas, more energy, but through less tissue. So in boxing terms, alphas have a, hard, uh, a more forceful punch, but less reach. Very interesting. Um, so I remembered uh, you know, re re reviewing the results of the vision trial that was uh, demonstrated last year. Um, do you mind uh, briefly summarizing those results and also uh, kind of talking about which ongoing trials you're uh, for the results you're looking, you're most looking forward to? Sure. So uh, the, the vision trial was the registration trial of um, lutetium-177 was the payload. The targeting molecule is called PSMA-617. It's a small molecule. Uh, that uh, is based on a urea core developed by Marty Pomper at uh, Johns Hopkins. And the vision trial was a randomized phase three study of patients with abiraterone or enzalutamide or some other androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, uh, pretreated patients who had also received at least one regimen of ataxane-based chemotherapy, if not two, um, who also had a positive PSMA PET scan. And these patients, post-ARPI 
and post-taxane chemotherapy with metastatic CRPC were randomized after their clinicians had put them on some standard of care, which could not be more chemotherapy or radiopharmaceutical therapy. Uh, they were randomized to either that standard of care plus lutetium or that standard of care alone. Um, and the lutetium was delivered in its conventional manner of six, of four to six doses given every six weeks. And those patients uh, who received the standard of care did not receive lutetium. The primary endpoint was overall survival and there was an alternate primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival as defined by Prostate Cancer Working Group 3. The trial to, to summarize showed really that all of its primary as well as its secondary endpoints were met. The lutetium relative to just the standard of care alone, prolonged survival, prolonged radiographic progression-free survival, and preserved quality of life. And that was uh, shown over the course of two meetings, one at ESMO and one at ASCO, and then in the New England Journal of Public, uh, New England Journal of Medicine publication. So um, it was uh, the hazard ratio yielded about a 40% improvement in OS, or put another way, a 40% a 40 reduction in the risk of dying. Um, and even greater gains in terms of RPFS, as well as uh, prolongation of quality of life. And those are, you know, very, once again, very um, interesting, promising results. Um, are there um, any ongoing trials uh, that you're um, looking forward to? Yeah. So that vision patient population is really quite advanced, right? Those patients are, are, have very few remaining treatment opportunities that uh, vision represented. But you, you know, in almost every other prostate cancer therapeutic that, that we've developed as a community, um, those gains are amplified in patients who receive therapy earlier as opposed to later. So there are two large phase three studies that are testing lutetium PSMA 617 in earlier clinical contexts than the one that vision represented. So one is the PSMA-4 trial that's in metastatic CRPC post an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, but pre-chemotherapy. Um, and that trial is a randomization to either the androgen receptor pathway inhibitor that they didn't receive for castration-sensitive disease or lutetium for six cycles with an RPFS primary endpoint. Um, and then there's a... PSMA addition trial, that's looking at newly diagnosed patients with castration sensitive disease, metastatic. And that's a randomization between ADT and the androgen receptor pathway inhibitor of physician's choice, plus or minus lutetium. And that has uh, an RPFS primary endpoint as well. So both of those will bring the lutetium basically from the latest phases of prostate cancer to even the earliest diagno you know, diagnosed patients with metastatic disease. So both, all three of those trials, vision, PSMA4 and PSMA addition are looking at patients with metastatic disease. Um, there's also a small, a small exploratory studies even in the, in the pre-metastatic population. And then there are several combination studies that are worth keeping your eye out on. One is with PSMA 617 in combination with the PARP inhibitors and the other with uh, immunotherapy with the checkpoint inhibitors. So those are the trials I'm keeping my eye out for the combinations trials and the earlier studies. I think all of us as a community are interested in further developments in terms of actinium 225. So uh, looking at the alpha emitters both in terms of upfront therapy with lower radial ligand therapy and as salvage therapy after lutetium. Right. Yeah, so in I, other words, there's a lot to keep your eye on. <laughs> right, yeah, no, I will eagerly await the results of those uh, studies. Um, and you know, going back to the vision trial, this is my uh, last question for you. I noticed that there was a, about 13% of the patients, uh, they didn't have PSMA positive disease. Um, could you comment on what role PSMA-directed therapy has in these patients, if any, and uh, what other targets that 
uh, or potentially on the horizon? Sure, the, uh, the, the idea behind Theranostics is that you're not gonna treat patients who don't look like they have the target. Because if they don't have the target, it's unlikely that patients will have a significant amount of radiation delivered to their cancers. And hence the vision trial did exclude 13% of the patients because their cancers didn't have enough PSMA expression. The criteria actually for the vision trial were relatively conservative relative to other studies of PSMA 617, which had higher thresholds in terms of letting patients into, into those trials to receive therapy. So most of the other prospective trials that preceded vision had more restrictive entry criteria based on the imaging. And indeed, that res those restrictions were not exclusively limited to PSMA imaging, but also included FDG PET imaging. Those, pay those other prospective studies, both of which were uh, conducted in Australia and uh, one of which was through ANZEP uh, as well, uh, used a combination of therapy. So they couldn't, they couldn't enter into those trials unless they both had you know, PSMA rich tumors and also didn't have areas in which there was PSMA negative uh, disease that was FDG positive. And it's possible that with that additional enrichment, uh, those patients you know, were, did have greater responses. Their, their PSA responses in those studies were somewhat higher than those seen in vision. And so we have to sort through what the role is for really two questions. First, who's gonna be the best patient to respond to uh, lutetium and radioligand therapy? How much PSMA expression do you need and how many PET scans should you have to establish those criteria? But also you don't wanna set barriers so high such that patients who have little, few other choices are precluded from getting potentially life-prolonging therapy, even if they may not be the best responders, but responders, but look, some of those patients, that's all that they have. So there's a balance there and we're trying to sort through as a field what that balance is. Clearly though, there are some patients for whom this therapy is simply inappropriate. And if you don't have PSMA expression at some level, uh, you probably should move on to, on to other therapies. And those could be other therapies with other targets. Um, and depending on what those targets may be, some patients will have genetic mutations that make them you know, uh, candidates for trials that target those all genetic alterations. Maybe there are MSI high patients and should get immunotherapy. Maybe those patients are HRD uh, you know, positive and so they should get uh, PARP inhibition. Maybe those patients have neuroendocrine differentiated disease and they should get chemotherapy. So there's still a whole world of other therapeutics than those that are PSMA directed that patients may be candidates for.